Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The objective for a demonstration today is to apply Pitt and Fisher sealant, the permanent first molars, and to put some special emphasis in the area of isolation and patient management. Our patient for today is Joshua. Joshua is five years and eight months old. Joshua is a young patient for the application of Pitt and Fisher sealant, and we'll see that their lower mandibular molars are erupted into position, but the maxillary molars are not in position at this time. Joshua is going to present some problems in the area of isolation, I'm sure. If you look at the x-rays, we can see that the lower first permanent molars, numbers 19 and 30, have erupted into the mouth and have reached the plane of occlusion. The maxillary molars are still covered with tissue and it's far too early to consider sealant placement there. If we look clinically into the mouth and evaluate the tooth surface, we want to isolate it to some extent and evaluate the tissue on the distal aspect of the marginal ridge. You see there a small operculum of tissue. This puts the tooth into stage two of development or eruption and is a candidate for Pitt and Fisher sealant, which we've decided to do here but not the most promising as far as prognosis without retreatment. And there's every likelihood that this tooth may have to be retreated early in its uh, sealant sequence in order to maintain integrity. We check all the pits and fissures. We see no soft penetrating areas that represent decay, a little debris accumulated in the surface, which will clean out to some extent. And we have a tooth that can benefit from sealant treatment, and uh, one will demonstrate the technique on. The initial aspect of our application is going to be to take a slurry of silex or pumice on a uh, unwebbed rubber cup and to essentially go in and clean that tooth surface with a non-fluoridated type paste in order to remove the debris that we were just looking at on the tooth surface itself. We're going to pumice the occlusal and the erupted part of the proximal surface as well to make sure that all debris is removed and we're down to a uh, clean surface layer of enamel that will respond readily to our acid etch pretreatment. <clears throat> Suction it out clean and we'll dry the surface off real well again and there is a little bit of remnant of the silex slurry that will stay on the surface even with rinsing. I like to moisten a cotton roll and then clean that surface off with a little scrubbing as well. Then we'll go back and we'll uh, re-rinse the surface and dry it again and be prepared now to actually place our isolation in preparation for the etching procedure. Cotton roll is placed in the lingual fold area under the tongue and put to place so that the tongue rests on top of it try to remove the tongue from the field as much as we can. A second cotton roll is placed again loosely on the buckle fold and we'll try to nestle that partially erupted tooth into the area with the two cotton rolls so that we have as well isolated a field as we possibly can. We recognize that that little operculum of tissue represents an area most likely to present difficulty in isolation and possible contamination of that distal surface. The alternative is to wait longer in the eruption sequence, get a better result, but to have the risk of decay developing in the interim. Here we see the two surface after it has been pumiced. We're ready now to apply the acid etching agent, 37% phosphoric acid. In this case, some products use 50%, but the acid is applied basically, and then we'll maintain the isolation while that occlusal surface is well moistened. We want to be sure and etch all inclined planes and make sure we've etched beyond our potential area to apply sealant. We apply another increment of acid at about 20 seconds after the initial increment is placed. Keep that surface moist with acid so that it doesn't dry out and we will eliminate the potential for forming salts on the surface that are difficult to rinse away and may contaminate the sealant bond. A third increment of, of material of acid is placed on the surface at about 40 seconds and then at 60 seconds we'll go in and rinse that surface carefully 
and make sure we have it well rinsed using water and the high volume evacuator so that that tooth gets a thorough rinsing for a period of about 20 seconds. Once the rinsing is completed and we've reached our 20 second period, this is where the assistant is very valuable part of the technique because she will now switch from the uh, water spray to a straight air. We'll rinse that surface carefully and now we can go in and look at the surface carefully and see the whitish opalescent color of a properly etched surface that extends through the grooves and out into the planes of the fissure. In this particular case we're going to use Prisma Shield, which is a, a light cure one paste system. We'll place a good sized drop of material from the tube onto a paper pad and then reseal the tube so no light is in there for potential pre-activation. We'll cover that pad or dispense sealant with an opaque dappen dish. In this case we'll use a little ball burnisher or dical applicator for our application. While we've been dispensing and preparing the material the sealant has maintained the, the uh, surface dry and we're going to come back now and just place the first initial increment on the distal aspect of the surface and have it go through the distal pit and the distal buckle and distal lingual grooves. The second increment is placed on top of the first increment and we begin to nurse that material then through the grooves to eliminate air voids into the central pit area. A third increment placed in the central area is nursed up into the mesial pits and then out the buckle and the lingual grooves until we get complete coverage. If it appears shallow, we'll place another increment over the old, seal old sealant that's been placed and then again readapt it to all the grooves to make sure we have complete coverage. Once we're satisfied that we have adequate coverage, we'll go back and put the light on the material, keeping the uh, opening of the light wand about a millimeter or so off the occlusal surface and expose that sealant then to about 20 seconds of light activation, keeping the first aspect of it towards the mesial aspect of the tooth. Then we'll uh, give it another 20 seconds, holding it more towards the distal aspect. And in this way, we ensure complete polymerization and maintain the uh, greatest amount of, of polymerization during that time. You'll notice that the tongue continually presents with a little bit of difficulty in maintaining that isolation. We've got to be very certain we have isolation during the time sealant's applied. Once it's applied, if a little bit of moisture gets on the surface during the light activation, this will not affect the curing of the material per se. The most important thing is to avoid contamination during its application. We've wiped this air inhibited layer from the surface with a moistened cotton roll. Now we'll inspect the cure of the material and see that the fissures are all covered, the pits are not able to be probed. We'll go out the buckle groove and we see that it's smooth and continuous. As we go out the lingual groove, there appears to be a little catch where the sealant did not flow well into the entire uh, termination of that groove. And this is an area that should be picked up now and re-acid etched, reapplied in that lingual groove, and we should have complete smooth marginal interface at the end of those grooves. We look around the distal pit and under that little operculum of tissue to make sure that there was no contamination that would make that loose and easily pried up. Go back and try that lingual groove to make sure that the material is intact and then we would go in and reapply. In this case now after reapplication we'll come back and check the occlusion. We know that Joshua has no maxillary first molar so we realize there wouldn't be any occlusal interference here but at any time a sealant is placed, we should always finalize the placement by checking the occlusion and make sure we haven't uh, added sealant in an area that will make it difficult to occlude. We'll go to the contralateral side now and look at the contralateral tooth, which is in essentially the same situation except the operculum of tissue does not overhang the distal marginal ridge quite as much as it did in the previous one. In this case, we're going to apply rubber dam and do a single tooth rubber dam application. We'll apply the topical anesthetic on two cotton swabs, one to the buckle, one to the lingual of the soft tissue adjacent to the tooth. We'll go in and 
dry that, rinse and dry that topical anesthetic off after it's had a minute or two to absorb into the tissue. The rubber dam is placed using a number 14A clamp. The clamp is seated on the lingual and the beak slid down over the buckle. And with a minimal amount of discomfort to the patient, we're able to seat that clamp. And then we go back and loosen the rubber dam just a little so there isn't too much tension. This tooth does not have a lot of undercut. We're deeply seated with the claws. Without any local anesthetic, you can see that the, the topical has taken care of the patient's discomfort. And we'll keep our index finger on the distal aspect of that clamp probably throughout the procedure. Since we're only dealing with a four or five minute procedure, it's going to make it relatively easy to maintain that clamp even though it may not have a lot of retention to it. We'll rinse the surface very well and then go back and use the pumice and the water slurry and clean that occlusal surface just, we, just as we did in the previous application. <clears throat> we'll go from the central pit using the rubber cup up the inclined planes and try to clean out the fissures as best we can. Again, notice the index finger stabilizing the clamp throughout the procedure so that it doesn't uh, inadvertently come off with tension by the rubber dam. Rinse the pumice off very carefully, suction it away. Then we'll use the cotton roll and come back in and scrub that surface a little bit to remove any residual film. And once again, we'll come back in and uh, rinse and dry that surface carefully so that we are able to have a dry surface during the time that uh, we're applying the sealant. The first thing to apply is the acid etching agent again, and once more we'll apply it in a similar manner. One application at the beginning, another application at the end of 20 seconds, a third application at the end of 40 seconds, and then a final application at the end of, uh, before we rinse at the end of the 60 second exposure time to the acid etching per se. As each increment of acid is applied, we nurse it into the grooves and make sure during that time that we do have complete isolation. Here we'll just take the little tabs of rubber dam off the wings of the clamp so that we can ensure a little better isolation around the base of it. Put another increment of acid in at 40 seconds and here we'll nurse it through the grooves, keeping that surface moist so that there's no potential for salts to form. Here we'll rinse out the area well and dry it off carefully and then inspect our acid etch surface to make sure it's uniform, it's opalescent, and it's the type of surface that will accept the sealant. We're going to use the Delton unfilled tinted sealant. We'll put one drop of the base resin in, one drop of the other component to the base resin into a little well. We only have 45 seconds to apply this, so we use a little syringe where the tip has already been cut in half to allow vertical dimension in order to uh, place the sealant. We use the tip of the syringe to mix the sealant in the well, suck up one little drop into the end of the clear tube, and then deposit it directly over the surface. We'd like to have this drop deposited on the surface within 45 seconds of the time we add the two drops together. One drop usually flows over the surface, as you can see in the mirror shot, and covers all of the fissures per se. If we need a second drop, we feel free to go ahead and add that. We allow that to wait for a period of three minutes. Because it is self-curing, then use the cotton roll and go back and scrub that surface to remove the air-inhibited layer. And now we'll check the ends of the fissures and find that they are, in this case, all intact, smooth, no marginal discrepancies at those interfaces, and the pits are all uniformly covered with the tinted sealant. You can see by Joshua's tongue that he's impatient to get the procedure done, but he certainly has cooperated very well. We'll remove the clamp and the rubber dam per se, and the procedure can be completed in an average time of about four to five minutes from the time we place the dam until we are able to rinse this area off and completely uh, isolate it again. We'll check the occlusion as we did in the last application just to ensure that we have no premature occlusal areas that have been overbuilt with sealant.
If there are areas that are premature on a sealant, we can use a number four round carbide burn, a slow speed hand piece, and reduce those prematurities. Joshua now has a sealant coating on both of his first permanent molars, and this should hold him with a minimal amount of maintenance and a potential for retreatment periodically throughout his life, a good protective coating that will eliminate or at least to a great extent eliminate the area of caries on his occlusal surfaces. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.